In 2012, a friend and I discovered a piggery in New South Wales, just 20 minutes from the border of our town. We thought one night that we'd go have a look. I'd been doing rescues inside chicken, turkey and egg farms for over a year, but other than saving individual lives, there'd been no real direction or greater purpose to what we were doing. I'd never been inside a pig farm. I took an old mini DV tape camera that I'd found in my closet, although in my nervousness I left it behind in the car. We found row after row of mother pigs in this piggery, confined to small cages for weeks at a time, in which they could only stand up, lie down, or take one or two steps forwards or backwards, unable to turn around. Piglets, sick or dying, their tails cut off by workers without pain relief, and dead ones lying next to their mothers or in the aisles or collected into buckets outside. Older pigs packed together in their own waste in small concrete pens. That first night when I walked out of the farrowing shed, there was something burning inside me that I'd never felt before, and I turned to my friend and said, we're going to shut this place down. We returned numerous times over two months, a small team of us, gathering as much evidence as we could to submit to the authorities and to show to the world, upgrading somewhere along the way to a slightly newer but still very cheap handy cam, and I quickly taught myself how to edit the footage together. We learned how to install hidden cameras, capturing workers kicking piglets like footballs and throwing them across the aisles while their mothers watched on helplessly. Behind the farrowing shed one night, we found a slaughter room, and sitting in its doorway, a wheelbarrow overflowing with entrails and empty beer bottles littering the floor. So we put our hidden cameras in there too, revealing how every Friday, the owner of the piggery would bludgeon pigs with a sledgehammer before cutting their throats, some taking over six minutes from that first hit to finally die. When we released all this footage, the public outcry was massive. There was extensive coverage across mainstream media, including primetime TV and radio news, people were shocked that this was happening in their own country. While we'd initially given the footage to the RSPCA in New South Wales, who had the power to seize the animals, lay charges against the owners and effectively shut the place down, very little action was taken for a long time. But eventually the public pressure forced them to initiate criminal proceedings with 53 charges of animal cruelty. All charges were later withdrawn after the New South Wales government intervened. And as we've recently learned, the owner of the piggery bribed those involved in the proceedings against him. The industry at the time responded to the footage by distancing themselves from the facility and its owners, claiming that he was a rogue operator, a one-off, not representative of standard pig farming in Australia. So we set out to prove them wrong. One by one, we exposed the same conditions, the same practices in pig farm after pig farm, 50 of them over two years. Occasionally we turn our attention to other species, meat chickens known as broilers and turkeys who are bred to grow so large and so fast their legs cannot support their weight. Ducks, aquatic animals who are farmed without access to water. And the slaughterhouses where they would all end up, regardless of any minute differences in how they're raised. We learned that the most common method of stunning pigs is the use of carbon dioxide gas chambers. And we managed to hide cameras inside the gas chamber at the largest pig slaughterhouse in the southern hemisphere, in Corowa, New South Wales capturing for the first time in the world the reality of a system that had been called humane for over 20 years. We saw that every pig who enters that chamber screams and thrashes in agonizing pain for over 30 seconds. The carbon dioxide reacts with the mucous membranes in their eyes, sinuses, lungs, nostrils, and lungs, sorry, lungs already, yep, turning to carbonic acid while they suffocate, pushing their noses through the bars of the gondola cages, desperately gasping for air as they are lowered deeper into the gas. We later captured the same thing at four other large slaughterhouses. This footage was seen by tens of millions of people worldwide, the first time consumers were able to see this process for themselves. I collated all this material into a documentary called Lucent, released in late 2014. And around eight months later, my home was raided by about a dozen police who took everything. Computers, hard drives, cameras, documents, clothing. Over those two years of documenting pig farms, there were numerous occasions where we'd come across animals who were in urgent need of veterinary care. Sows with massive maggot-infested maggot infested prolapses. Another sow who had given birth to a litter of stillborns, leading to paralysis in her back legs, and when she couldn't pull herself to the food and water at the front of her cage, she started eating her own legs. My car had even been trashed by pig farmers after they found hidden cameras, and they then hunted us for five hours before we were able to get away. On each of these occasions, we went to the police and we were ignored. But for my troubles, for my attempts to alert consumers to what they were paying for and my attempts to make the world a better place, I was charged with four counts of obtaining footage and photographs and six counts of publishing it in Australia's first ever ag-gag case. 
One of these publication charges was for that gas chamber footage. The law I was charged with with the New South Wales was the New South Wales Surveillance Devices Act, a perfectly legitimate law intended to protect privacy and prevent things like hidden cameras being placed in bathrooms, now used for the first time to target animal advocates and the exposure of cruelty. I was lectured, belittled and filmed as my home was torn upside down by about a dozen police and I was then sent through the court system like any other criminal, while the perpetrators of everything we had witnessed and filmed were allowed to continue operating business as usual. Some painted as the victims of vegan extremists or as community heroes and leaders in animal welfare. The New South Wales and federal governments, under pressure from the animal agriculture industry, were trying to make an example of us, to stimmy this release of footage that had embarrassed and undermined them and their marketing slogans for the last several years. And for a few days after the raid, I felt like it had worked. I wanted to give up. I couldn't think properly, I was just angry and confused, and I kept thinking about all the footage I'd lost because I didn't have it backed up anywhere off-site. Stories I'd never be able to tell, suffering witnessed only by me, now meaningless. Eventually I found a way to channel that anger, that desperation to tell these unst untold stories of suffering and grief and bloody merciless brutality. I launched a crowdfunding campaign for a new film entitled Dominion, which would go far beyond what Lucent did. So instead of backing down and succumbing to intimidation, we ramped up our efforts. This time capturing and exposing to millions the maceration of day-old male chicks in the country's largest hatchery for the egg industry. We'd known for a long time that this process happened in Australia, just as it does all over the world, but never had it been filmed here. At this particular hatchery, the macerator was hidden out of sight from workers in a sealed room. A friend who once applied for a job there to try and work undercover was told, don't worry, you won't have to see what happens to the male chicks. The room is only entered at the end of each day so that the machine can be cleaned. If anyone tries to open the door into that room while the macerator is in operation, it shuts off, both as a safety feature and as a means of ensuring nobody can ever film it. So we snuck in there overnight and I hid inside that room, dressed in the same clothes as the workers, while my team locked the door from the outside and left the property. I removed the lid of the macerator and waited in it, waited beside it in that little room for several hours until the conveyor belt started. And before long, thousands upon thousands of fluffy yellow hours old chicks came along it from the sorting room outside and dropped off the end into the unrelenting metal blades, their tiny bodies torn apart while I filmed it with a handheld camera. When the workers went on their usual 15 minute break at 8.30 a.m., I pushed out a block of wall that we'd loosened over several nights, crawled out of that room before standing up, putting the block back in place and walking out of the facility without raising an eyebrow. If this place hadn't insisted on such secrecy, if they hadn't been so determined to prevent anyone ever capturing on camera this horrific process, I could have never hidden mere meters from a dozen workers filming the entire thing and then publishing it to massive mainstream media coverage. Days after that story broke, a group of about 20 of us stormed the facility and physically shut down the macerator for hours, chaining onto the conveyor belts and bringing out over 150 male chicks who had been seconds from death. None of us were arrested or charged, and the issue received even further media attention. And we continued investigating and exposing. The repeated impregnation of cows in the dairy industry, and the routine taking and slaughtering of their male calves who are unwanted by the industry. There is something particularly heartbreaking about meeting these tiny, fragile, days-old calves in the slaughterhouse holding pens where they cry out in confused desperation for their mothers, suckling our fingers and so perfectly representing the absolute callous heartlessness, heartlessness of this industry. The factory farming of fish in toxic sea cages off the coast of Tasmania and the apparently humane slaughter method of freezing farmed fish to death. The factory farming and brutal slaughter of crocodiles for international luxury brands in Darwin captive lions, tigers and primates living a life of extreme boredom and confinement and frustration for the entertainment of paying spectators. We revealed the fate of ex-racehorses sold to dark, dingy knackeries in New South Wales by owners who no longer saw them as profitable, including none other than billionaire Jerry Harvey. Far from the fake glamour of the Melbourne Cup or the Magic Millions, these horses are coldly shot in the head with a rifle and turned into pet food. And when a so-called high-welfare barn-laid egg farm caught fire and the owners closed the doors with tens of thousands of hens inside to maximise their insurance payout, we were there in the aftermath to film their charred bodies and ensure their tragic story did not go untold. 
We exposed unthinkable cruelty at slaughterhouse after slaughterhouse, reinforcing that for every one of these thinking, feeling beings sent through those doors, there is always fear, there is always, always pain, never a willingness or desire to die, and never a humane way to kill someone who wants to live. We did eventually shut down that first piggery. Not because we gave the footage to the authorities, but because we published it. The pressure became too much for the owners. Their reputation was tarnished. And so they stopped breeding pigs, the flowering sheds sitting dark, empty and overrun with cobwebs when we returned in the final months. The remaining pigs at the farm ultimately sent to slaughter and never replaced. By then though, it was hard to see the closure, the closure as much of a victory. Knowing so much more about the sheer scale and inherent unyielding cruelty of the animal agriculture industry than we had in those early days. I knew the focus had to be on the system as a whole, not on shutting down individual facilities. This system is only able to exist because of two things. Secrecy. Secrecy fiercely protected by an industry and its government allies who are reliant on propaganda, misinformation, attacks on the credibility of people like us who challenge that secrecy and on oppressive laws like AGAG designed to criminalize transparency. And secondly, the explicit, explicit exemptions from animal welfare laws that would otherwise make just about everything that happens in farms, slaughterhouses, knackeries, greyhound and horse training facilities, animal laboratories and so on, illegal. Here in Western Australia, the Animal Welfare Act claims to promote and protect the welfare, safety and health of animals and to ensure animals are properly and humanely treated, cared for, cared for and managed. It explicitly states that a person must not be cruel to an animal, for example, by causing them unnecessary harm, with a minimum penalty of $2,000 and a maximum of $50,000 in imprisonment for five years. That sounds reasonably strong. It then states that a defense to an act of cruelty is where that cruelty is considered normal animal husbandry, i.e. a generally accepted practice in a farm, zoo, breeding or training establishment, etc. It's also a defense if the cruelty is done in accordance with an industry code of practice. These codes of practice exist for the sole purpose of legalizing what would otherwise be criminal acts of animal cruelty, and they are why you can receive a substantial fine or jail term for using scissors to cut the tail off a dog or a cat without pain relief, Yet you can form, perform that very same procedure on countless young piglets in a commercial piggery with legal immunity. We know that pigs are just as capable of feeling pain and suffering as dogs and cats. This has nothing to do with differences in intelligence or sentience or the capacity to suffer. The difference is their commercial viability as a result of our society's attitude that some species are for loving and some are for eating. It is incredibly difficult and daunting as one individual or as a small team to take on such a deeply ingrained attitude, but when we have, when we have the tiniest fraction of the resources and power of those who depend on it for profit. But at the same time, the public is on our side. We are a nation of animal lovers. And I still believe that for most Australians, if they really knew what was happening, what they were paying for, they'd stop paying for it. They'd stop supporting this industry. But of course, there are so many excuses people come up with to convince themselves that it's not as bad as we say it is. When you have governments on both the state and federal levels downplaying or ignoring the cruelty and passing new laws to limit public awareness of it, those excuses become so much easier, so much more convincing. And instead of addressing the systemic and entirely unjustifiable cruelty that motivates people like me to go into these places and investigate or rescue, the conversation is manipulated onto, into focusing on those people. What's more, the government department responsible for the welfare of farmed animals is the same one responsible for the promotion and economic success of the industry dependent on their suffering. But as much as secrecy keeps these industries from crumbling, I believe it also makes it inevitable. The more they resist transparency, the more we can exploit that resistance and force it upon them. This coming week, on Monday or Tuesday night, we'll be releasing our latest campaign, following an exclusive piece on ABC's 7.30 program, which I think will serve as a perfect example of using the industry's reliance on secrecy against them. The following week, we'll be coordinating an entire week of action around the five-year anniversary of Dominion's release, culminating in the second Dominion Animal Rights March in Melbourne. The first march, just after the film's release in 2018, saw about 3,000 people join together and take to the streets of Melbourne with a message of hope and unity. Our movement may have lost some momentum, thanks in part to years of the pandemic, but I believe the time has come again to rise and demand the kind of world that we know is possible. 
For anyone who is angered enough by what our investigations have revealed and wants to know how you can get active in demanding change, I'll be back here tomorrow at 2.25 with my campaign director, Harley, for a workshop on direct action planning. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? first went vegan a couple years ago when I was at uni, I watched too much gas chamber footage and I think it permanently altered my brain chemistry and I don't know, I was wondering if you had any advice on knowing what you know and seeing what you've seen, what advice do you have for having the strength to keep going and keep doing activism and basically get through each day, each week, each month and have hope? is a very difficult question and uh, it's something I'm constantly trying to figure out and I think I've, I reached a point a long time ago where I just passed the point of no return and you get very desensitized to what you're seeing and it starts to affect your ability to feel at all uh, with anything not just when you're watching footage but in your day-to-day -day life it, it, it numbs you um, and I think I feel a lot of the time like I'm I'm way too far past that point, but if you're not quite at that point, my advice would be to, to pull back and, and really look after yourself and know your limits and figure out what gives you, what fills you up again. I mean, it might be spending time with the rescued animals at the sanctuary. That used to be really important to me. Maybe not so much these days. I don't get as much out of it as I used to, but certainly after rescues and, and investigations in, in the early days, I'd go just spend time at a sanctuary and it would really kind of remind me what it's all about and why it's important to keep fighting um, and I think just finding people who you can who understand the understand what you're going through and, and how messed up this system is and who you can relate to in that way and you don't have, feel like you have to shut that part of you off you can be open about it I think it's really important to, to find those people and yeah, talk about it and not let yourself get numb. And if you feel yourself going that way, get get some help. Talk to a therapist. Um, I'm seeing a therapist a lot more regularly now than I used to, and I think it's I should have done it a long time ago. Um, yeah, there's there is a lot to be hopeful for and thankful for in this movement. I think we have come a long way in the last few years. It's really feel like we're taking some steps backwards, but I think there's still there's still a lot to be hopeful for. And, um, yeah, I hope that. Okay, that's it.